Welcome back to Man Down Sports. As you can see from the thumbnail, we got another exciting episode for y'all. The rundown, you can see it's for JJ Reddick, Gills Arena, Melo, LeBron. We got a lot of topics uh, for y'all. This uh, video uh, would not be live. I would not be taking live phone calls. So if you're watching this, it's probably a premiere. Um, but uh, we will be live tonight if you're watching this on Friday. Uh, yeah, we'll be live tonight uh, with the full panel so y'all can call in and give y'all opinions on whatever the topics are for Friday night, right? Um, as you can hear my voice, I'm still under the weather a little bit. Uh, you know, little stuffy, stuffy nasal and all that stuff. And uh, uh, I, I think I had a head cold. I don't know. I don't know what the deal was, but it felt like the flu a little bit, but it only lasted for like a day. But now it's just a, just a cold, but I think I'm getting through it. Um, but yeah, uh, this is going to be a good episode, man. And it is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the best place to play fantasy sports. I want to tell you about the easiest way to get in on some NBA action with Underdog Fantasy and their pick em game. Just find your favorite player or any player for that matter. Pick higher or lower on that player's stats and you can win up to 20 times your money in one night. Pick between two or five players to fill your pick em entry. Get every pick right, and you can net yourself some serious cash. Use the promo code MANDOWNSPORTS, and you can get your deposit doubled up to $100. You got to check on the map to make sure your state is eligible to play Underdog Fantasy. But as soon as you do, and if your state is, go ahead and download Underdog Fantasy's app. Use the promo code MANDOWNSPORTS, and you can, like I said, you can get that $100 uh, match on your first deposit. And I would want to thank Underdog Fantasy for sponsoring Mandown Sports. All right, so I'm going through the internet and, and I see JJ Reddit did an interview with Shaq on his podcast. And it was just full of uh just delusion. And man, I've look, I've covered some stuff JJ Reddit said before. I mean, we're gonna get into some of it. Um, so we you know, we gotta kind of dip back into the history, but I mean he said some just outlandish, idiotic stuff about Larry Bird. Uh, but we're going to get into that a little bit later. Well, uh, what I want to do uh, first is 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 go through some of the stuff he said on the Shaq's podcast. So it's going to be about four sound bites um, with this with this segment, because J.J. Reddick is I mean, he's this man. He's got to be stopped. I don't know what his agenda is. A actually, no, I do. I do know what his agenda is. Um, he's 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 for this new era of basketball. He's for analytics and he's for LeBron. So anything that he needs to say or any narrative that he needs to push, he's going to push it uh, at, you know, he's, he, and he's going to be all for the analytics. I, I just don't understand how people buy into analytics so much. It's basketball. It's not freaking statistics or math. It's basketball. People keep stats and keep statistics and, you know, uh, people get analytical with it, but it's at the end of the day, it's basketball. Right. So we are supposed to keep basketball at the foundation and the base of everything. Basketball is basketball. The purpose of it is to win. The purpose of it is not uh, percentages and, 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 and all that stuff. The purpose of it is to win. So, uh, yeah, but let, let's let's just get into some of the stuff he said, man, starting with uh, him trying to make the claim that the entire era that Michael Jordan played in was just watered down because of the expansion teams. Listen to it. I refuse to get into the GOAT debate. I don't care. They didn't play against each other. I do not care. What makes him great, well, a bunch of things, but what has made him great is the fact that he's done it now for 21 years at the highest level. Like, you talk about scoring. That's great. So one guy averaged 35 a year. Yeah, LeBron's never averaged 35 in a year. Guess what? He's averaged... 25 or more for 20 straight years. No one's had more than 15 of those years. Like that to me is he's a scorer. But but again, it looks differently. It, he plays differently. So it's all it's all in the eye of the beholder. LeBron is great to me because he's always done it the right way. When I played with LeBron, he was the greatest young leader I've ever seen. Man, stop stealing stuff from my podcast. No, man. he was. No, like, because cause I, <laughs> no, because when I, I mean, listen, I, I know he was, and I'm such a dominant personality. Like, I'm the guy that, I'm the guy that no matter what team I'm going to, this is my, nobody says. 
But when I got there, like he just he just ran it so perfectly. The way he treated the guys, the way he treated the organization, the way he was coached, the way he looked out for guys, like I don't even have to do nothing. And you know, we were we definitely had a chance to win. We were in first the whole year and big baby with his wife broke my hand, I had to be out for six weeks and we came out and then lost to Boston. I, I wish I wish I wouldn't have had that, that, that absence away from LeBron, but he was one of the greatest young leaders that I've always seen. So he will always be in that in that conversation. Only thing I don't like about the conversation is they don't put my boy's name in it. You're right. I don't get who either. But if you're going to be throwing names around, got to, you, you got to have my boy's name in it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Dwight? That's like, huh? Yeah, Dwight. That's like, that's like saying, that's like saying, what are the best luxury cars out there? Lexus or a Beamer? You got to put the Mercedes in there too. Yeah. Just, just I don't, like, I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't give I, I don't I, care. I truly don't. But Mike, LeBron, or Kobe, now y'all debate. That's that's all I say about it. I think it's fair to just say there are different tiers of greatness. And you could, by the way, like, I think it's fair even to be like, who's your Mount Rushmore? Who's your who's your four greatest or who's your five greatest? Who's your who's your ten greatest? Whatever it may be. Like, we're 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 nitpicking by the way a lot of times we're comparing errors we're comparing different rules we're comparing the fact that look like i'll say this with michael jordan and, and I, I don't mean this to be controversial but like everybody talks about all these the, the context of this era michael jordan the dallas mavericks were, were were added as the 23rd team in 1981 jordan was drafted during his heyday six teams were added to the nba they were 90 players added to the nba like that that does that not water down i'm not talking playoffs by the way no chance we're talking playoffs does that not water down the regular season to a degree uh first of all it, jj is one of these dudes that has the look and the sound of a very smart guy and he might be very smart, but when it comes to his basketball takes, when he's trying to support a player or an idea of something, he conveniently becomes very ignorant. And the reason why I say that is because he's really trying to make the case that <laughs> – that the entire era was watered down. And here are the two big the, the, the two big things about him saying or making that claim that it was watered down. Uh number one is if it was watered down, what what does that mean for Michael Jordan, right? Um because you're 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 trying to make a uh a you're 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 pretty much trying to make a case against Mike uh when it when it comes to the the GOAT debate. So you're saying that uh, since his, I mean, like when you make a statement, you have to tell me what that statement means. So if you're saying that his era was watered down, I want to know what, what's the further claim that you're trying to make or what's the point you're trying to make because his era was watered down that his accomplishments should be looked at, you know, uh, a little bit lesser, like, oh, you played in the watered down league. Like, you know, like when we look at the uh, the 11 rings that uh, Bill Russell won, and we say, yeah, he won 11 link rings, but it was only eight teams. You know, a lot of things was different, right? I, I understand that. I get that. But for you to say that it was watered down, are you also saying that because it was watered down, we should take it, they should take a little edge off of his six rings? Uh, or, or are you saying him as a player, uh, you know, he looked like he was that good, but he really wasn't. It was just the fact that the arrow was watered down, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is the claim of it being watered down is bogus in the first place because <laughs> how was it watered down because of the expansion team? This is what I remember about the Toronto, the Canada, uh, the two Canada expansion teams, because, uh, you know, that was that was in my time while I was watching a lot of uh, NBA. You know, I, I'm still like an encyclopedia with that. 
So when Vancouver and Toronto got their expansion teams, what I remember about it is there was an expansion draft. Um, and in the expansion draft, the teams that, are, that already existed were able to protect their top eight. You could pick eight players off your roster that you're going to protect. And if you look at all these teams in the playoff, they go eight deep. Those top eight players are the ones that are playing. They're starting five, they're six man, and then two supporting cast, uh, cast members. They might go nine deep, but they rarely go ten deep in the playoffs. Most of these teams are going eight deep, right? Um, so for you to have a team to protect your top eight players on that team, you're not you're not losing much. So you're bringing in two existing teams, and they're able to pick off the bottom of each roster. That you know, in that special draft, the guys that are available for the draft, they're picking from that. And they're picking free agents, right? So these are not players that are in the big three right now. Like if we had that special team right now, the way JJ Reddick is talking is like <clears throat> the way JJ Reddick is talking is that uh those uh 90 players that sound like a whole lot of players, right? But he said they had six expansion teams from 81 to the time Jordan retired. I think the last two expansion teams was 95, 96 when the uh, the Raptors and the uh, 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 Vancouver Grizzlies came in. <coughs> Man, uh, so six teams. I think Orlando was one. New Jersey might have been one. Charlotte, a couple of, you know, I can't remember all the teams, right? But you can look them up. Uh, so since 81, they bring, they brought two teams in, expansion draft, draft pick. They go on, right? Did it again. And then toward the end of his career, they did it again. He he threw that 90 number out there like that was supposed to be like, oh, my God, 90 new players came in the league, and these are 90 players that just came from off the streets, I guess, right? These 90 players was not good, you know, so the fact that there was expansion teams, that means we got 99 NBA players that's on the NBA court, and he want people to believe that the league is watered down now because of expansion teams. That's the dumbest thing in the world. Like that's dumb. They was picking players off of existing rosters and players that was free agents. They wasn't going on the street to pick players up to just fill these seats or fill or fill these slots in the uh on the roster. Right. If I remember correctly, uh Vancouver and Toronto both got the one and the number one and number two pick. And I think Toronto got Dan uh Damon Stoudemire number one, and Vancouver might have got Big Country Reeves number two. And then they went and picked, started picking up free agents. And, I, you know, I remember Blue Edwards. He was pretty good on the Vancouver Grizzlies. They had Blue Edwards. Um, Toronto, you know, f- start filling their roster up. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how does that make the league watered down? Like, you're still going to have the same amount of teams going to the playoffs. And when you get in the playoffs, you got you to gotta beat real teams. And in the teams that was already existing – they didn't lose their top eight players. So that's my first point. It's just dumb to say it was watered down, right? But further on in that interview, more of J.J. Reddit delusion came out, more his prickness and his uh, uh, sense of entitlement and his, uh, you know, his overinflated ego came out uh, when they asked the question, if you and Shaq was to play together, how would that work out? This is what he said. When when you look sit next to Shaq right now, how would you even approach that relationship if y'all would have played together in the prime, working together and using your three point shot and his dominance down low? Are we playing in 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 sort of the end of no. my era, or are we playing not the old Shaq? Your no, era? Both primes, medium Shaq, not the old Shaq, um, not the Cleveland Shaq. The L.A. Orlando Miami Shack. I would I would say this. I would say there is a a very real possibility, um, and I lived this like with Blake. I lived it with uh, Dwight. I lived it with um, with Joel as well. It's like if I'm on the court with you, I'm always going to be the guy feeding you in the post. I'm always going to be that next man. So if they double, right? They've either got to make a decision. They got to double off of me from the weak side, or if they double with my guy, I'm the next man. I'm the easiest pass, right? 
that creates a decision to make. I, if it happened later in my career, I would have probably grabbed you the first day and been like, Hey, here's what I like in terms of like dribble handoffs, screenaways, all that stuff. You would have did what? I would have grabbed you. Grab who? Grab you. And you would have told me what you like? Yeah. And I would have been like, do me a favor, my guy. Yeah, and I know what you would have said. I would have said, just get in the corner, and when I throw it to you, just make it. Yeah, but this is... You know who tried to... Devin George tried to... When, when you're... He's a shooter. I said, how about I don't give a... What you like? How about when Devin I Devin George? Yes. Like, I know who Devin George is. I'm like, I'm like, listen, I know you're a shooter. I know who you are, but we're not doing all that. When you throw it, and they bring three guys, at and I kick it back out, just hit the shot. That's all. Devin George shot 34% for his career from three. I would, there's, there's levels to this, Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just look that up on the yes. phone? <laughs> no, but I was just trying to make, you know, the correlation of, you know, shooters. I, I've always loved playing with shooters. Yeah. I've always loved playing with shooters. D. Scott, Glenn Rice. Uh, my favorite one, one of my favorite shooters, he, he didn't get a lot of playing time, but Mike Penberthy. You remember him, Mike Pembrothy? Yeah, so he, like he used to get him, throw it to him, and that would always make it. To be clear. I, I like Mike Pembrothy. Of course, Glenn Rice and D. Scott, you know, they both was 40% above uh, for their career for shooting threes, but that's not what made them great free throw sh- uh, three-point shooters. What made them great three-point shooters is because they hit threes, timely, clutch threes, and they hit them often. And the thing about Glenn Rice is he was a number one on the Miami Heat. He was a number one on the Charlotte Hornets, right? Then he went and played with uh, the Lakers and was a role player, but he was an all-star. He was he was a guy who was counted on for points, and he shot that high of a percentage, right? He wasn't a guy standing in the corner that, you know, was waiting for Shaq to get doubled so he can get a shot, right? He was creating shots, right? Um, so... Let me just back up to uh, J.J. Reddick getting asked that question and how he answered it. He They asked him, how would it be if you played with Shaq? And he just started going into all of this, oh, man, you know, I would be the one feed you in the post, and they would have a decision to make and all that. Dude, J.J. Reddick, you're not that dude, bro. You're not that dude. You're not you, – I mean, you seriously, bro. Like, any team that was, was – was, where you was part of the game plan, like – if, the, if if a team had you and you just happen to be a, a three-point shooter that can hit open threes if a double came and they can bring you off the bench like Steve Kerr was with the Bulls or like Craig Hodges was with the Bulls or like uh, Pim Berthy was with the Lakers, then that team was a good team. But if that team had you starting and you was part of the game plan and they was running plays for you, then that was a good sign that that team was going nowhere fast. Right? So for your ego to be like, yeah, I would be feeding you and, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, you wouldn't. You would be somewhere standing in the corner for uh, three minutes a quarter. If that you, you're going to get eight minutes a game. And I need you to, if you get, if, if you get the ball in a corner off a double team, I need you to hit it. Just like Shaq said, he said, no, you're not. <laughs> oh, oh, and then and then he come out and said, yeah, uh, at the beginning of the season, I will, I will pull you to the side and, and tell you why I like the ball. For, for what? What are you telling Shaq where you like the ball at? That's not what shooters do in, a, in, in an offense with Shaq. Shooters, like he said, stand in the corner and wait for him to pass the ball. Because if I got Shaq in the paint, why am I doing dribble handoffs with JJ Red? He said, I, I need you to know why I like my how I like my dribble handoffs. Who's running a dribble handoff when you got Shaq on your squad? The ball is going in the post as much as we can get it in the post, and everything is going to come off of that. Right? If we're in the half court and it's not fast break and Shaq's on the floor, we're going to Shaq, we're going to the big fella a hundred times out of a hundred. Every time down court, unless something else happens, some type of early offense. But other than that, no, I need I need Shaq to touch that ball. Either he's going to dunk you in the rim, get fouled, or the double's going to come early enough where he had to make the pass uh, out to the uh, to the perimeter, and we might can get a three point shot off of that. We're we're not running plays for JJ Reddy to get a a, a a open shot. We don't believe we don't we don't want to live and die by JJ Reddy. But he seemed his, he seemed to think that, and when Shaq 
what Shaq, uh, <laughs> what Shaq said, well, you going to pull who to the side? Nah, nah, they ain't going down, right? When he said that, J.J. Reddick was so shocked that the next thing he had to do was attack Devin George when Devin George's name came up. Because he said, man, you know who told me what you just told me? Devin George told me that. And I was like, no, you're going to stand in the corner and wait for me to pass you the ball. So J.J. Reddick was like, Devin George? Like, immediately, like, who is Devin George? So he Googled him just to see what his three-point percentage was. Because that's what that's the claim, the fame that J.J. Reddick got. He shot it 41% for his career. So that's his claim. That's how he he judge everybody, right? Because he, he needs to feel important as a three-point shooter. So he judges everybody based off their percentage as far as shooting. And if you wasn't 40 or 41% like he was, then he's going to call you not a great shooter. He tried that with Larry Bird. We'll get to that in a second, right? So he looks up Devin George and see that he was a 34% free throw sh uh, three-point shooter for his career and says, oh, man, he's just a 34% uh, shooter, man. It's levels to this. So that was, that was his way of saying, well, Devin George, of course, don't have the right to pull you to the side and say, this is how I like the ball. This is why I like the ball. This is how I like to do my dribble handoffs because he's not on my level. But I'm, a, I'm, I'm J.J. Reddick. I shot it at 41%. So I should be able to do that. That's basically what he was saying. Devin George don't have that right, but me as J.J. Reddick, 41% guy, I do, right? And earlier last year, he pulled that same stunt on Larry Bird on first take, and he was having a conversation with Stephen A. Smith and Mad Dog Russo about great shooters. And Mad Dog Russo, you know he's an old-school guy and was like one of the greatest shooters he ever seen shoot the ball was Larry Bird. Most of us would agree with that because we watched the game and we know he was deadly. We know you couldn't leave him open. You know, we uh, we know he was a threat from there, right? We 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 know Bird was a deadly three-point shooter, but guess what? If you Google Bird's three-point percentage, it's going to be around 35%, just like Devin George's was, right? So, no, I'm lying. It's not 35%. Let me, let me get the exact. Let me look at Larry Bird's three-point percentage because it's not 35%. It's a little bit higher than that. Hold on. Larry Bird. And Larry Bird's three-point percentage is because I'm over here lying on Larry Bird. <laughs> Larry Bird's three-point percentage was 37%. Right. So I I I shorted him two percentage. It was 37%. Right. So when when they was having that conversation, J.J. Reddick was like, Larry Bird is not one of the greatest three point shooters the NBA have ever seen. He only shot at 37 percent. So he he judged greatness and great shooting by their percentage. And here's the difference between the 37 percent that Bird shot versus the 41 percent that J.J. Reddick shot. Larry Bird was a number one on his team. Larry Bird had to generate offense for his team. He was the number one option. He was a heck of a passer. He was averaging probably close to 10 assists a game. Um, he was handling the ball. He was posting up. He was passing. He was rebounding. He got about 10 rebounds a game and, and, and was getting close to 30 points a game, right? That's the pressure he had. The defense he was getting – on him was always the best defender. He's getting Dominique Wilkins on him. He's getting James Worthy on him. He's getting Michael Cooper on him. Like, he's getting the best defenders on him, right? The best. And the game plan is to never let Larry Bird get an open shot. Never. We want other guys to get open shots, but Bird cannot get an open shot. So the shots that Larry Bird might get with the best defender on him with all the pressure on him uh, and not ever getting an open shot, barely getting an open shot, 37% is a great percentage for someone with all that pressure. But for J.J. Reddick to not have to generate offense, not have to handle the ball, he don't even have to play defense. They're hiding him on defense. Uh, they're not running real plays for him. And he's waiting for a great player like LeBron, Shaq, Blake Griffin, 
CP3. He's waiting on them to draw double teams for him to get his open three. So most of his threes are wide open. Right? When you're when you're Steve Kerr, JJ Reddick, Kyle Corver, or, or one of those specialists, three-point specialists, that's not the focal point of the offense. Never going, we're, we're never coming to a Clipper game and saying we need to put our best defender on JJ Reddick. No, we want our best uh, uh, post player to guard Blake, and we want our best perimeter player to guard CP3. We're not wasting our best defender on JJ Reddick, right? So you're not getting that much attention. There's no game plan uh, at practice on how to stop JJ Reddick. He's a corner boy. You wait for the double team, shoot the open three. So you're getting open threes. So for you to be 41% and Bird to be 37 and all of yours are open and all the birds are, 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 are heavily defended, it's very disrespectful for you to come in and, and push back on him being a, uh, one of the greatest shooters in the league all because of a percentage. That's the same thing they do with Kobe. Oh, your percentage was low field goal wise, so you're you, you not that you're not as great as people say you are. What? We don't play the 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 ends to the mean or the means to the end. The end goal is to win and to win rings. The end goal is not your shooting percentage. We can care less about that. You you know how many times <laughs> when I was playing ball. Uh, I don't like turnovers. So if I get the ball and, um, you know, I get in a situation, I'd rather take that shot, right? It's, it, it's certain shots that I've, I've worked on a whole lot that I feel like I can make. So if, 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 I, if I mess around to see my big man in the post, or not in the post, I just see him in the paint, and I see that, the person that's down there with him can't rebound with him. And I don't have an opportunity to get him the ball. I will put the shot up. It's a 50 50 chance I make it. I might make the shot, but if I miss it, the rebound is probably going to go to my guy. Right? That's it's times where I've I've I took shots like that and I didn't care about my percentage. I didn't care if that was going to be, oh, it, it's going to be a miss because it, the, the the thought process is if I do miss it, he's going to get the rebound more often than not. And sometimes Kobe used to tell Shaq that or or anybody or any big man that, hey, y'all not touching the ball, you better get off the rebound. Yeah, that's a real thing. Get it off the rebound. Hustle, work. I'm not I'm not throwing the ball to you uh, down there. Get it off the rebound. I'm about, I'm about to take over. Get it off the rebound. Yeah, will my percentage go down? Yeah, but we're trying to win this game. And if the end goal is we win and I shot 45% in a win and I had 30, I'm cool with that. Nope, nobody's ending the game and saying, oh, the team with the highest percentage won. No, the team with the most points won. And, then, you know, that, that ain't based on a percentage. It's just based on the overall game, offense, defense, all of that stuff, right? So, um, he tried to pull that stuff, man, uh, with, with, with Larry Bird and Michael Cooper wore him out. Well, you know what I'm going to say? This J.J. Reddick, this kid here, you know, this kid here who's a journeyman, played for six different teams. All his accolades came in college, played 15 years in the NBA, was being shifted around from team to team because all he could do was shoot. And he wasn't that great of a shooter. He was a poor man, Danny Ainge, because Steph is being played more physical. They got his hands on. In today's NBA, I don't know what game he's looking at. If You can't touch the guy. Anytime you touch anybody, a three-point shooter, come close to them when they're landing, it's a foul. J.J. Reddick needs to be quiet and stop trying to compare. I think he's gotten out of this what he wants to, is that his name being thrown around and the attention and all that. But you know what? It's attention that he's not going to want because a lot of former players, myself just as one, along with Dominique, talk about this guy who's a poor man, Jeff Hornacek, uh, a guy that, uh, uh, you know, why would he even say that? And when all he got, and when he's talking about that, you got you can't say that by watching game film. You have to talk to the players that lived it. I lived that '80s era, with, and Larry Bird was one of the greatest three-point shooters that's ever played this game. Fuck percentages. It ain't about that. It's about hitting big shots. 
things that he couldn't do as a player without getting a pick set for him. So, uh, you know, when people compare each generation, and I appreciate and love basketball, I enjoy each decade. You know, I have so much respect going all the way back to the 60s and watching Bob Cousy. That's where it started. Cousy. That's where it started with Reddick. Not to interrupt you, but about six months ago or a year ago, Reddick was calling Bob Cousy a plumber who couldn't dribble with his left hand. Well, he got a lot of nerve to say that about Bob Cousy. He could barely dribble with his left hand, with his right hand. And that was the best hand he had, J.J. Reddick. Couldn't get open without a pick being set. So, you know, that, that guy, man, it's, it's sad because um, you, you have to have respect from where this game comes from. All these guys in today's game, I'll say from maybe five years ago up until where it's going to go, are living, playing, breathing off the shoulders of Bob Cousy, Will Chamberlain, Bob Pettit, players that came in. Then you just go through the decades as you come up with Jerry West, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor. These guys are making money, making having fame with the way that we used to play the game. And for him to call out, and you know what? I hate Larry Bird, but I respect the hell out of that man because I went against him in all those championships and during the year. I, I, all we did as the Lakers is thought about the Boston Celtics. When our season began, yeah, we had to play the Seattles, the, the Phoenixes, the, all those teams, but our main goal was to prepare, uh, sharpen ourselves up because the Celtics were the team that we had to beat. So, and, and, and man, y'all got to y'all got to hear that whole soundbite, man. Michael Cooper did not like it. You got to hear Dominique Wilkins as well. He did not like it last year when he said, "Let it." Went. I mean, it, it it ain't even that the words he said. It's also the way he said it. Like he just rolled his eyes and just scoffed at the idea that Larry Bird can be mentioned as one of the great shooters. But he didn't say that Larry Bird was the greatest shooter of all time. He said one of the greatest shooters I've ever seen was Larry Bird. And J.J. Reddit was like, oh, my God, don't give me that baloney. Like, Larry Bird was not the greatest, one of the greatest shooters that the NBA ever seen. He only shot it at 37%. You know, it, like, he just, I mean, he was just so annoyed by the fact that you even mentioned Bird name. A guy like that, and they're talking about this guy uh, uh, in all of these uh, job interviews. They say he just interviewed for the Charlotte head coaching job. He interviewed for Toronto head coaching job last uh, last year. I honestly, man, I've never wished someone uh, not to get an opportunity, but this, this guys like him is the is the reason why the league is suffering and 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 it's going to be the downfall of the league for you not to respect the one. JJ Reddit should be kissing Larry Bird's feet. Like seriously, JJ Reddit should be kissing Larry Bird's feet. As as a basketball player, Larry Bird is like the Caesar of the NBA. He like, and I'm talking about Caesar from the Planet of the Apes. He's the first ape that talked and took over. Like he's the beginning of everything. This is this is the guy that you write about. This is if if there was an NBA Bible. Larry Bird would be one of them ones. He would be one of them ones that we talk about like Moses. You get what I'm saying? That's what Bird is one of Magic Johnson is that. Jordan definitely is one is one. And, and all the people that Michael Cooper just mentioned. You don't you don't just scoff over names like that. When that name is mentioned in basketball circles, you you supposed to have reverence for those guys. You you don't you don't try to put the error down and 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 say that this error was nothing and it was watered down. You don't start making up BS like that. If that was legit, that's one thing. But it's not even legit. You're just you're just doing it to diminish because you're trying to defend this error and uh and you're trying to defend analytics and you're trying to defend LeBron. So you go on an attack on all the greats. I wouldn't want to be associated with this dude. I wouldn't be. I mean, and there's another segment on this podcast where they talk about how JJ Reddick got an MVP vote. He's had it for the last couple of years, and 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 JJ Reddick has been in the media. For, he's been working for ESPN with the last since he retired for the last three years. He's had his podcast a little bit longer than that, so he's an official media member for the last three years, and he immediately gets an a, a MVP vote. And Shaq was like, "You got an MVP vote." How you get an MVP vote? 
Shaq's been working for TNT for 12 years. He don't have an MVP, MVP, MVP vote. And he's a Hall of Famer. He's a top 15 or top 20 player of all time. Right? And a former MVP. And J.J. Reddit was like, yeah, I just got an email, said, do you want, you want an MVP vote? And I, I responded, yes. So now he's an official MVP voter. I'm trying to figure out how, whatever the committee is, how they scouting people to give them MVP votes. I think it's like 100, 150 people that got votes. How are they finding new people to get? Oh, man, J.J. Reddick would be a good idea. But not a former MVP. Not a player that know what it takes to get MVP. But a player who's never even gotten close to an MVP. Not even gotten close. I don't even think he's gotten close to an all-star. Let's get him the vote. Like, make that make sense. That I mean, it literally makes no sense at it, it, it all, right? But these are the people that we want in the NBA. Someone that's pushing analytics, who's who's diminishing previous errors. I mean, this dude is diabolical, man. And this is the, and this is what we want. Um, but yeah, I'm glad Michael Cooper undressed him like that, man. But he's been rubbing a lot of people the wrong way, and I think he knows what he's doing. He knows this is a crock of. He know this is baloney. He 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 knows it. He's he's not that dumb. He's not that dumb. But he's gonna keep saying this BS because he knows it, you know it's it's an audience for it. And I don't I don't know, man. I can't put my finger on it, but I I just think that is just absolutely uh just 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 dumb, man. The era was watered down because of expansion teams. But how was it watered down? How was it watered down because of expansion teams? You get a new team, they get the first draft pick. Right. So, okay. So you got two teams that are not competitive. So how does that water down the league? Because you still got the same competitive teams. You just got two, you just got two teams that that's not going to be competitive for a while. All right. So you got two extra wins on your, on your win column. Okay. Two extra wins. Does that constitute the whole league being watered down for two extra leagues? And what's the importance of it anyway if neither one of them will go be in the playoffs? All the playoff teams from the previous year got the same uh, basic uh, roster as far as the top side of it goes. The top eight guys, you got the same potency. You just got two extra teams that are not competitive. That doesn't water down the entire era or, or water down the, the entire league. That is that is just asinine. That's dumb. Uh, that is dumb, man, but let me know what y'all think in the comments, man. Uh, what y'all think about JJ Reddy? I think he's an idiot, but that's my thoughts. Other thing I wanted to get into is Gilbert Arenas, man. On Gil's Arena, and I've done several. Uh, and shout out to Gilbert Arenas and shout out to Gil's Arena. They they make so much good content. You know, I I I I basically watch them every day if I get a chance to watch them. Um, of course, I'm subscribed and all that stuff, man. So shout out to Gil. Uh, I, I think he watched my show too. I think I seen Gil in, in my comment section one time. But uh, yeah, Gil, if 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 you see this man, shout out to you, and uh, I'm you know I appreciate you uh <laughs> putting out good content so we can react to it, man. But in this particular segment, uh, McCants, dude, this is what I like about McCants. He's he says some outrageous things, and a lot of times he look foolish when he says them. Uh, but I, because I think he he wants to be a shock jock a little bit, uh, so sometimes he, he you know it's hit or miss with him. But when it comes to LeBron, Kobe, and Jordan, Rashad McCants absolutely cooks the entire Gills Arena every single time. Because the the thing about Rashad McCants is he's speaking from a more logical position, and Brandon Jennings, Gibb Arenas, and uh, even sometimes Kenya Martin is speaking from a respect level for LeBron and a need to defend him against the so-called haters. So it's personal for them. It's uh, emotional for them, you know, because they got connections. I, you know, Gibb Arenas got a connection with LeBron because uh, LeBron – Ask him to train his sons, and you know they develop a relationship with that. 
Um, and I, I don't know what all the connections is with uh, Brandon Jennings and, and, and Kenya Martin, but uh, it's emotional for them because Kenya Martin has already stated he hasn't seen a, he hasn't seen a play against nobody better than uh, Kobe Bryant, hundred percent. So he's already admitted to that. So all his love for uh, LeBron and uh, a need to defend him uh, strikes me as odd from Kenya, but that's what they do every time they get on the LeBron topic. McCants is is preaching something totally different than what Arenas is doing, and it's so obvious uh, for Arenas. You know, a lot of times Kenya Martin just sits back and chill and let them do their thing and and then brandon jennings is just saying like he you know he's like uh puff dad in the background take that take that you know he, he, his his voice is like a little whisper Kenyon is quiet and then gilbert is the one that's doing the back and forth with rashad mccants uh and that's how it usually goes and gilbert is just obviously i'm a lebron guy i'm going to defend him just every single time right so but listen to this exchange we know how great LeBron what I'm is, saying is and we we're don't, not taking away from him. We're don't greatness. count it because against you, them. Because the A's don't make you better than the other greats. Because you're playing longer than the other greats play don't mean you're greater than anything. Who's, Everyone has their own no, greatness. Said, we're no one says that, that only, only LeBron no. haters use great. No, we're saying, there's no such thing as a LeBron hater. It's just reality. <laughs> what? It's just reality. I it's just reality. They're, they're called up. Everybody's everybody everybody no. that When you mention Bron, you know what they say in the comments? Man, why are you niggas hating Brian so much? Why, 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 yeah. why, why? Oh, no, it's, it's like, so no they right can't now. be no opposition. No, no they can't yeah. be no opposition. Why, why do they need to be? Are you a basketball, are, are you a basketball a, fan? Listen, when you play against somebody, what's the other side? There's no what other, you why you would, there's no other side. It's like, an opponent? Yeah. It's the opposition. Yes. Exactly. Right. So you're not yeah. playing against a bunch of motherfuckers who want you to score every time and we just ole it. That means I got defense here. It's defense here. You know what I am? I'm the f***ing defense. You like, and y'all don't like my defense. That's why. What? You don't like that I, I'm here to say, no, nah, I don't like that. No, nah, I don't respect I, that. Oh, okay. no, nah, I'm cool on that. But what does that hey, mean? What is this mean? basketball? <laughs> That's a, that, well, you're saying a whole bunch of nothing. <laughs> Just f***ing basketball. But what are you saying? I'm the defense. You are, you are. I'm the villain. If he's a hero, I'm the villain. I'm, well, I'm why does it have to be a hero or a villain? villain? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, you don't have to pick side. If you're a basketball fan, you're a basketball fan. I'm a student. Means, I'm not a fan. That means you know the difference. You like, I'm a student. You like I'm a player. Not a fan. You like a player. So that means if you, that's that's the problem. I like the game, Gilbert. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Because if you like the game, you will like LeBron. What? If you like the game. No. No, you will like no, LeBron. If no, you love no, the game, no. you will if love you his like greatness. LeBron, you like LeBron. That's the difference. I like LeBron. The game is bigger I like than LeBron. Magic. The game is I like Jack. Than, the game is I like Kareem. I like Bird. I like Duncan. I like basketball. So I you, watch the game. I watch the game. I'm not rooting against Jokic and him. I'm cheering my You are a liar. I'm rooting my team on. on. You're a LeBron fan. I'm a basketball fan. Fan. All of y'all have already came I'm out a and said Laker it. Fan. Steve just re she just she just revealed himself I yesterday. Know, I know. You already know. Steve just took a taco <laughs> from you. Literally, Steve just took I a taco from you. Literally, have said in the group chat, "I'm a LeBron fan." I'm a Laker fan. His mouth. If anybody, if anybody watch me on my live, if anybody watch my lives when I'm watching basketball <laughs> and I'm watching the Lakers, I'm rooting for the Lakers. I'm not an anti-Denver fan. Come on. I'm rooting for my team. I'm not saying, man, f you I, Oh, that was a good shot. That's Come a bad on. shot. Pass the ball. Good thing. I'm and cheering nobody, my team. And ain't nobody on this side is saying anti. Oh, I hate this. I hate you. This. No, it's not. Nigga. You're an anti Laker fan. I respect and you're an anti LeBron. LeBron fan. I respect LeBron. Mm -hmm. I don't have to root for him. I don't have to be on that fan sh with him. I know basketball. I know when you do some bull, I'm here to call that sh out. Box out. Back door. Man, what was that? You didn't even run back. What's all this complaining Y'all don't like that shit. I get it, but I'm here to call it out because ain't nobody else here. I didn't go to LeBron camp. I ain't got to be the that's training his son. I ain't that getting invited to Taco Tuesday. You know who I'm that nigga? I'm like, I don't like that shit. I don't like the way you walk. I don't like the way you talk. I don't like the way you dress. I don't like none of that So here's, here's the point. What McCants is saying is you know why he's saying I'm the defense is because when when you are 
a major supporter of LeBron, you have to ignore a lot of things that are negative about LeBron. So when it, say for instance, they start talking about this longevity thing. You know, that's the major thing with LeBron supporters is they want to talk about longevity. His longevity has to make him in this discussion. And I'm thinking in my head, like, what if he didn't play this long and he did what everyone else did and played about 15 years and felt like, okay, I accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish. I'm at about year 15. This is about, this is a good time to call it, call it quits and go do something else, right? I have nothing else to prove. Like, you know, say for instance, Michael Jordan, 15 years, two, three peaks, a lot of MVPs, all this other stuff. You know, people consider me the greatest. What else I got to prove? Like, why why am I getting up every day, uh, putting in this amount of work to keep doing this? And to prove what? What I what I got to prove? So most people, you know, get on the pot, use it, and then get off the pot, right? Or you know, whatever the saying is, you know, either get on the pot, either either piss or get off the pot, right? You know, most people get on the pot, piss, and then get off, right? LeBron got on the pot and pissed. You know, it's time for him to get off. It's obvious now that he need to be off the pot. When when Le, when Kobe Bryant realized, oh man, I can't beat these dudes no more. I might still be considered one of the best, right? Well, actually, no, because uh, uh, Kobe's uh, year. Be- I want to say the year before he even tore his Achilles, they came out with the top one hundred, and they had Kobe at like number fifty, right? So the disrespect was already there. But no one seems to want to do that for LeBron. They keep stuck trying to act like this dude is still a top five player in the league, and he's not, right? But but the stats make you think his longevity is something different than what we've ever seen before. You know, uh, <laughs> and I, I don't believe that. But even if it was, it doesn't put you in a GOAT discussion just, just based on longevity. They don't that, – that puts you in a GOAT of bodies. Yeah, your body is, is, is GOATed. Yeah, you got a goat body. Okay, your body held up longer than everybody. That's a goat body. That's great. But the goat of basketball is is not the goat body. Right? I I, I want to say we had uh, a lineman that played for the Houston Oilers, and when the Houston Oilers changed to the Tennessee Titans, he was still there. I want to say his last name was Matthews. He might have played center or, or, or somewhere on the O-line. Man, this dude played, I mean, for that position, this dude played 21, 20, 20, 22 years, right? Y'all can look it up and find out for sure. But Matthews played a long time. That that tells me your body is something different. But they don't make you one of the GOAT centers of all time. I'm still looking at Kelsey. I'm still looking at Pouncey. You know, I'm still looking at a lot of uh, a lot of different players at that position, and just because they didn't play 22 years like you did, does not make them less of you. And that's what McKenzie is saying. He was like, "Y'all keep talking this longevity. The longevity does not move the needle like y'all think it does. It's just LeBron fans and supporters that are trying to use that to to push some narrative that don't that shouldn't exist in the first place." This is what it's like for LeBron with this longevity thing. And I, I and I think I heard this somewhere, and I don't know why I heard it. Um, I, I, either I heard it somewhere or it dropped in my head one day. But <laughs> LeBron is like the, um, the high school graduate that's in college right now that keeps coming back to the high school, hanging around campus, trying to pick up girls, trying to talk to old basketball players, you know, that he used to run when he was there, right? You know, you know, trying to be that big guy on campus when you don't even belong in that campus no more, right? That That's what LeBron, that, that's what it feels like when you hang around too long. LeBron's supposed to be out of there. He won't leave. Why won't he leave? Like, it's, it's, it's always a, 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 a cycle, when your son or your daughter get old enough, you know, you're supposed to be developing them and preparing them to one day leave the nest. Once, they, once they've outgrown your home, 
they got to go. Once you've outgrown high school, you got to go. And there's a there's a, a time limit on it. High school, four years. Get up out of here. I don't need 20-year-olds hanging around these 17-year-olds. Get up out of here. It's not your league anymore. College, once you outgrow college, get out of here. Imagine if Michael Jordan, you know, won a championship as a freshman, one player of the year, his sophomore uh, year, uh, played one more of his junior year, and then he got up out of there because he he outgrown college, felt like he was ready for the NBA. Once you're ready, you need to go. Imagine if he was like, yeah, I'm ready for the NBA, but I'm going to play my senior year. And and before I play my senior year, I'm going to use my red shirt gear to get an extra year and then come at my senior year. Imagine if he stayed five years just to try to, you know, build his college resume. You know, uh, Kareem won f- f- three or four times at UCLA. I want to try to get close to that. Imagine outstanding your welcome for some, I mean, I don't even know what the motivation is. At this point, it's, it's either uh, I want to play with Bronny or I want to keep building my resume or both. But it ain't for a freaking championship. That's not the number one goal. That might be on the list. That might be on the priority list, but that's not the real. That's not the real. That's not the real. What what it really is, he's sticking around for Bronny, his resume, and then it might be championship. But I honestly I don't think I I I don't think championship is that high on the priority list. I really don't. I really don't, man. <laughs> and, and if it is, why? Your time is up. Your time, your time is up. You knew your time was up when you wasn't the apex predator anymore in the league. Jokic hunting you down two years in a row in the uh, playoffs. Sweep, gentlemen sweep. It ain't your time no more. And when Kobe realized that and figured that out, he was like, yeah, if I can't come out here and dominate no more, ain't no point in me being out here. When, you, when, you're, when you're an apex predator and then you're not anymore, what are you sticking around for? Go home. Stop wasting these people time and money. Stop asking them for 60 mil a year and then pretend like you're trying to get to the finals when you're really not. 60 mil for what? A first round exit and a gentleman sweep? LeBron James, a stat came out that LeBron James and the Lakers, since he since he showed up to the Lakers, got a a, a perfectly even 500 record. They're 134 and 134 since LeBron has showed up. And some people think it's a success because he won a, a tournament in Orlando in an in-season tournament. If the if the bubble ring tournament was so significant and such a huge accomplishment, then why the hell did you fire Frank Vogel who coached you to that accomplishment? If the in-season tournament was really worth hanging a banner over, then why would you fire Darvin Ham, which the rumors is they're going to fire Darvin Ham in a couple of weeks, why would you fire him if he led you to the in-season tournament? The truth is, you don't think that highly of the bubble, the bubble ring, or the in-season tournament. Because if you thought highly of it, those coaches' jobs would not be in danger. That's the net net of it. That's the truth of it. Right? So, yeah, he's the high school graduate that's in his sophomore year in college that just can't stay away from high, high school campus. He keeps showing up with his with his uh his Lincoln Town car, his uh, or his Honda with uh with nice rim, uh, spin, spinning rims on it. You know what I mean? Um, he keeps showing up there and 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 picking up these junior and seniors, females, and riding off, taking them to Chick Fil A for lunch. That's that's what LeBron's doing. He's he's impressing babies. He's impressing babies, but these babies are actually embarrassing him and beating him. Like Jokic sent them home two years in a row. This, I mean, we don't want to see 
keep seeing you go down like this, man. And 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 his fans are just thinking that if he could just get these stats and 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 make it look similar to what it was when he was in his prime, we go say he's had no significant drop off. You know, someone told me that earlier in my Facebook group. He said, uh, we need to celebrate LeBron. We've never seen a 39-year-old play at this level before. Um, and he's had no significant drop-off, right? But you can't expect a 39-year-old to win a championship. And I was like, wait, if you had no significant drop-off, then why is the why is the uh expectations uh dropping off significantly? You get what I'm saying? Like, like if 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 I got a car and when I first got the car, I could drive across the country with no problems. The car had no issues, right? But then 20 years later, you tell me, uh, you might not want to take that car out of town. You know what I mean? I don't know how it's going to act. But then you go tell me it had no significant drop-off. That don't really make sense. It had no significant drop-off, but now I can't, I can't dr- drive it with the same expectations as when I first got it. I can't go cross country with it, but it's had no significant drop off. So you're telling me LeBron had no significant drop off, but we can't expect the championship for him at 39. Make it make sense. And then y'all tell me in the comment section if I'm if I'm tripping. Moving on to Carmelo Anthony, and this this is pertaining to Anthony Edwards and Kevin Durant, right? Uh, Carmelo Anthony said he didn't like the way Kevin Durant was allowed and it was to talk to him and, and, and go at him in the playoffs, right? And I didn't either. And I said from the beginning, I said Anthony Edwards is doing what Phil, not Phil, but what Pat Riley used to accuse Michael Jordan of doing. So Michael Jordan was friends with Charles Barkley, Charles Oakley, Patrick Ewing. Uh, he was friends with all those guys, good friends. They gambled together. Magic Johnson, too. They, you know, they played cards, gambled. And when they would play, it didn't matter if it was uh, a regular season game or playoffs, Michael Jordan, when he came to New York, he would hang out with Oakley and Ewan. And Pat Riley had a rule when he was coaching the Knicks that don't go hang out with Michael Jordan, don't go fraternize with the, with the competition. And I want to say it was either Pat or one of the Van Gundys later on that said that Michael Jordan would friend you so, so you can let your guards down and then chop your head off in the game. And it might be a little bit of truth to that, but I think it was a genuine friendship. I don't think he was being their friends just for that purpose, but it is true. And I felt this before I had a really good friend that was about a year maybe a year and a half older than me, right? Um, and he was better at basketball than me for most of our young. He, he was better at basketball than me all the way till ninth grade. And I feel like I passed him, right? Um, th- this is what helped me pass him mentally. Uh, one day we was at a, a camp and my team was balling. His team was balling, and uh, we both was doing good, and then we met in a championship game, right? And how I was scoring on people previous to that game had some of the uh, the grown-ups, like, excited to see me face up with him because he was doing the same thing in his games. And then when we played, I didn't know that I wasn't given 100% until – after the first quarter, one of the guys pulled me to the side and said, I know that's your best friend, but he's not letting up on you. He's trying to chop your head off and you're taking it easy on him. And when he told me that, I thought about it and it was true. I value his friendship so much and he was such a competitive guy. Um, and, I, you know, I've, I've learned my I had learned my lesson with him. Uh, through childhood that if I got the best of him, he, he he was so competitive and so petty that it would, like, it it would mess the relationship up. Seriously. Like, you know, and, and I, I would have to think about that in the back of my head 
how how hard I would. So I would play him fair. I wouldn't I wouldn't rough him up. I wouldn't uh, foul him. I wouldn't try to uh, uh, go at his go at his head. I wouldn't try to embarrass him. I wouldn't do all that stuff. I would still try to play my hardest. But you know, it's a certain type of uh, it's a certain type of demeanor you got when you're trying to ch- chop somebody's head off. And he would have that toward me, but I wouldn't give it back to him because I know if I gave it back to him, we weren't going to be friends for a couple of days. I, that was a weird thing, right? So mentally, it took me a while to get over that, and that guy helped me with it. So I, I think it might be something like that when Michael Jordan are friends with Patrick Ewing and all those dudes. And, 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 and I guess these dudes probably don't feel like that. They're professionals, and they probably feel like that they could uh, be friends with him and then uh, – get on the court and want to take his head off. But Pat Riley and, and Van Gunders, they didn't think so. They felt like that Michael Jordan was taking some of their edge off by being their friend. Well, anyway, I say I like to say this. Anthony Edwards would sing Kevin Durant's praises in the press. Oh, that's my favorite player. And he's been doing it for the last couple of years. So it's not like it's fake. He really do think Kevin Durant is one of the best players he ever seen. He said the best player he ever uh, uh, studied. He said he studies Kevin Durant. He said he's so good. Right. He really does believe that. And he says it humbly. But it also is probably letting Kevin Durant's guard down a little bit. Right. Because he's seeing that this guy, this younger guy is admiring him so much. And and Kevin Durant was probably like, eh, I ain't going to go with him and chop his head. You, you remember how Pat Beverly was coming at Kevin Durant? And when he was at the Warriors and Kevin Durant was like, man, you know who I am. I'm Kevin Durant. He came out and gave the Clippers. 45 and like three quarters uh in a playoff game. That's what Kevin Durant needed to do with Ant, but he couldn't, right? For some reason, right? And uh I wanted to see that from Kevin Durant. Well, here's what Carmelo Anthony thought about it. Melo said he would have been out for blood if Anthony Edwards treated him the same way he treated KD. Let's take a listen to what Melo had to say. That little young dude called his shot before he even started versus legend. Is that not crazy? I love it. When I'm well, sitting at so home, I, I, I would have been like, this thing is bucking. <laughs> I don't want to kill his little nigga. Like, That's what I'm <laughs> saying. I would have been out for blood. They moving out his way. In a competitive <laughs> way, I would have been out for blood. Because yeah, I'm yeah, taking yeah. that as, what? You just call me out in front of Malika? It's just that it goes back to say, you got to know how to put these pieces together. And I get what Phoenix did. They said, we going all in. We got to go out, Thomas. Now we got to put all the chips on the table. We got to go. These young boys ain't trying to hear that. None of these young boys in this league is trying to hear that. What you mean go out for blood? Ocho, remember we had a conversation the other night? Yeah. We all ready to fight. What you going to do? Oh, did you hit me in my nose? Right. For real? That's what you want? <laughs> but, but. Bro, you in the hoop game. I, I, I understand what you. you talk about, though. In a hoop you? game, when you ain't saying nothing, you just out there playing. Now you got somebody talking trash to you? Oh, it raises the level of play just a little bit. That's why when somebody, when you add trash talking to the game and you're competing, it forces you or it makes you want to play at a higher level, even though you're in the middle of a game already. It just, I think that's 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 where he's coming coming from. But that's with not Alpha Kevin Durant's game. You just told me when you started talking and somebody started talking back, they're gonna get angry. They're gonna get out their game because oh, that's yeah. not their game. And, and now I know you got I got him. him. I know oh, I got you him. want Kevin Durant to do something that he doesn't normally do. No, nah, see, but what, what Melo's saying is the way Melo played and the style Melo played, if Ann would have been talking to him, Melo, listen, they would have lost the game. <laughs> yeah. They would have lost that game. Melo would have had about 60 because nobody else is shooting that ball. If, yeah. <laughs> come, on, come on down here. Come on down here. He would have hit him with all them elbows that he does he does to everybody. And he would have put young fell in that basket. Yeah. He would have yeah. jeopardized. He would have jeopardized that loss to prove a point. And that's what I wanted to see Kevin Durant do. Right. And Shannon Sharp is arguing against it, saying you can't sacrifice, you can't do that in the playoffs. You can't, you can't uh uh go at somebody like that in the playoffs because it's gonna take you out of your game. Yes, you absolutely can do that. Right, Michael Jordan and Kobe used to do it all the time. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what Edwards was doing, right? And not doing it got you four old. So, I mean, at some point when you was down two old, you shot it. You probably should have been thinking about, I'm gonna go at him because the, you know not going at him wasn't working. So I'm not with Shannon Sharp on saying, nah, you can't, you can't do that. Nah, Camelo's right. Like you got this young fella going at you. Hey man, you still Kevin Durant. Like, where's the attitude when when the Clippers was doing it to you? 
and and you said, man, y'all know who I am. I'm Kevin Durant. Like I, I get the attitude that he had with Pat Beverly because when Pat Beverly was going at him uh, on the court, he was still being passive. But they won the game, and he didn't have to put up a lot of shots to win, right? But uh, when they asked him about it in the, in the post game, and he said, man, y'all know who I am. I'm Kevin Durant. When he said that, he came out there with a with a focus the next game. I'm gonna show y'all who I am. And I, I, I mean, I, I, I never forget. I wasn't home, so I missed the first quarter of that game. When someone, uh, Zoe texted me and was like, "Man, y'all see what Kevin Durant doing?" And I think he was like eight for eight in the first quarter. <laughs> all, all, just all buckets from all over the floor, right? And uh, I was like, "Yeah, yeah." That he he came out and showed y'all who he was, man. The dude is phenomenal, but to allow Anthony Edwards to come at you like that in front of everybody on national TV on that big stage, and you just say, "Yeah, I'm just gonna stay uh, within the flow of the offense." Nah, I would have took over. I, I think I think Carmelo Anthony is 100 percent right, man. You should have took over at that moment because that's exactly what Anthony Edwards did. And Anthony Edwards wasn't even doing it the whole four quarters, but in the fourth quarter, it was all Ant Man. He made for sure of that. And that's what I would have liked to see uh, Kevin Durant. Even if you didn't do it uh, in the uh, in the early quarters, by the time that fourth quarter came, and that's a lot of times, a lot of those uh, games, uh, the fourth, the game was lost in the fourth quarter. That's when Kevin Durant should have been Kevin Durant. Uh, so I'm with Carmelo Anthony on that one. Uh, y'all let me know what y'all think in the comments. Uh, more J.J. Reddick. And this is LeBron James and J.J. with the Mind the Game podcast. Um, I got two clips. <laughs> this is this is JJ Reddick trying to make his uh he's trying to make his case for analytics and analytics as it pertains to three-point shooting, right? What's a good shot and what's not a good shot based on analytics, right? He's he's trying to break down, you know, uh you, you know, when you coach basketball, a, a, a coach, let's let's say a coach like Bobby Knight or an old school coach like Larry Brown in the in the NBA. Um imagine getting you taking the ball out of the net, other team just score, you bringing the ball up court. It's the first, I don't know, eight seconds in the shot clock. That's what JJ Reddick was saying. Between 18 and 24 seconds, that's early shot clock. That's what he said. Coaches didn't like uh, a three-point shot to be jacked up in that period, in that time frame, right? But for, for two reasons. One, we felt like we can get, we can jack up a contested three at any time in the shot clock. Like, we don't we don't have to design that shot. We can get that shot anytime we want to. So don't waste it on the first 18 to 24 seconds. The first 18 to 24 seconds, not the first 18 to 24 seconds, but between 24 to 18 seconds from the shot clock, um, we trying to get early offense in a form of getting an easy basket, something like a layup, right? So uh, if it's in transition, you're, you're training your big man to run from baseline to baseline and getting on a block. And and you might if if you got a a big man like Rasheed Wallace or David Robinson who can outrun most centers that's guarding them, most of the time when you get down there to that paint, you're gonna have a mismatch because you're gonna beat the center down there, and someone's gonna have to fill that lane that's gonna be a guard or a wing player or a smaller forward, and you can just put him on your back, right in front of the rim, post up ask for the ball, early offense, I turn around, either I'm getting an easy layup or foul or and one. that We call that early offense, right? And we want it to be layups for an easy basket. We're looking for that first. Now, if we come down and we can't get that, now we set up our offense and we run a play, right? We run a play. You know, this is when your point guard can decide, am I going to my best player? Or am I, do I got a mismatch somewhere? Am I going in the post? Uh, are we going to run a play that we've been running five times in a row that they ain't been able to stop yet? You know, we're trying to get into something that's that's going to be uh, good for us, right? Now, that three-point shot that J.J. Reddick is trying to <laughs> debate that's a good shot, we can get that anytime in the shot clock. 
But what J.J. Reddick is trying to dis- explain is that when we do the numbers analytically, he said that the shot that you, the three point shot that you jack up in the early offense has a high percentage of, of going in for the last couple of years. And now he's saying that's a good shot. Listen to him. Yeah. Here, here's another interesting thing I found about, about threes. Um, so let's call 18 to 24 seconds on the shot clock. Let's okay. call that early shot clock. Yep. Okay. First six seconds of the shot clock. Um, in 2014, 2015, the average team for the season took 322 total threes in the first six seconds of the shot clock. Okay. What is this? You said 13, 14? Yeah. Uh, okay. 14, 15. 14, five, 15. Five teams attempted below 200 total threes for the season in the first six <laughs> seconds of the shot clock. Yep. Um, last season's data, that number was up by 100 total threes, basically mm-hmm. 420 total threes. Yep. Uh, half the league attempted 400 or more total threes in the first six seconds of the shot clock. That's the other thing that has changed the most is when you get a defensive stop, I don't care where the fuck you are on the court when you get this stop, where are people running? Yeah. Run wide. That's all you <laughs> Run hear. wide. Run wide. To the three-point line. That's it. Okay. Right? So these early, early shot clock threes um, you know what the official average effective field goal percentage on that is? Uh, Same thing, fifty-five percent. Really? It's a good shot. I can't, it's a I can't good wrap shot. My, I can't wrap my head around it. If I mean, am I too old school? I want to say old school, but am I too still like in my ways of? Okay, hold just, on a second. Hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you something zero here. Zero pass shots. I'm gonna give you something here, though. <laughs> I'm gonna give you something. You got guys running wide. Correct. Running, run at the corner. This is you with the ball. Yeah. This is Giannis with the ball. Yeah. This is John ja Morant with mm-hmm. the ball. Space. What does that give you? So much space. Early, early attacks. There's a reason that you motherfuckers are early attacks. averaging like ten fast break points. Early a game. attacks. Yeah. yeah. Somebody told me I was second in fast break points the other day. Who? Who did we just play? Oh no, it was uh, it was Toronto. Yeah, one of their players said, man, what the hell are you doing? How are you second? Because they, I think they played the night before, so they had a walkthrough on their court. And then as soon as the court opened, I get on the court, and one of their players is like, how the hell are you second at fast break points? It's because this is where D'Lo's running, dude. And this is where Austin's running. Well, D'Lo like to stop a little. Right? <laughs> he's like, he, he likes he's to like stop. a break. Yeah, he's, yeah, a, he's, he's a break, break guy. guy. Yeah, he, he loves to break. break. <laughs> but definitely, Rui, AR, yeah. TP, they definitely get into the corners. So the volume of threes. Yeah. So he's having that conversation saying, look, man, when, when, when you get a defensive rebound and everyone is running to the three-point line, right, that, that leaves the paint wide open. So what I described earlier or how it used to be done because we want our big men to rim run. This would be your Shaqs, your Dwight Howards, your Rasheed Wallaces, your David Robinsons. These are these guys, Elijah Wan, running full speed to get to the other side of the rim on a defensive uh, stop, right, and try to get early offense. What they're saying now is we don't don't coach like that no more. We coach that everyone runs to the three-point line. Now the lane is wide open, and you got a freight train like Giannis or LeBron coming straight down the middle with the ball. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. Um, And and, and that's cool. The paint is wide open. We're still trying to get somebody in the, you know, to the rim. So – Essentially, it's the same thing, except uh, we got a center running to the paint trying to get early offense, and we got a guard like Mark Jackson running the point who might provide that pass down low for early offense. But they're not doing that. We got we got our biggest freight train bring the ball up. So instead of David Robinson rim running, in this era, David Robinson would be uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, right? And he would be going coast to coast uh uh trying to get to the paint and making passes to a uh, to a three point shooter. Let you know what I got some footage of David Robinson going coast to coast. And I wasn't planning on showing this, but I just want y'all to see uh, you know, first of all, he moves just as good if not better as Giannis. They got the same body type. He might be a little bit more muscular than Giannis, right? But he dribbles the ball better than Giannis. 
honestly, and he definitely shoots it better than him. But look at him, little baby Euro step. Look at him go, look, look at it, coast to coast. Fat, he faster than everybody on the court, right? That's that's David Robinson. If David Robinson played in this era, like this, this is the thing people don't realize about the 90s. Athletes at the center position were just as good as athletes uh, that we have now. Uh, their shooting touch was just as good. Um, and their dribbling skills was just as good, right? But we don't give them credit for that because – uh, the way th- the way they was coached back then is coaches did not want their big man going coast to coast. Even Shaq could go coast to coast like Giannis, right? So this this thing that we seeing with Giannis, a lot of people thought that this was unique and we've never seen it before. No, nah, we've seen it with with David Robinson a hundred percent. But David Robinson, look at it, he could shoot with it, right? Uh, so but we so we seen it with David Robinson. But my point is. I guess that's what J.J. Reddick, if he was coaching, he would have David Robinson doing. Or he would have David Robinson on the bench. I don't I don't know where they use David Robinson. I don't know where he goes. If he's not the one that's coming down the court with the ball like a freight train like LeBron or Giannis, I don't know where he goes. He's not going to run to the three-point line. So in this version of what J.J. Reddick is talking about, there are a lot of players that's obsolete in this, in this, in this ideal. Like what do you what do you do with Shaq? If you got Shaq on your team, would you still instruct your players to run straight to the three point line, including Shaq, so you can have the paint wide open for LeBron? Like if LeBron and Shaq's on the same team, are you really saying we're gonna we're gonna uh, value the spread floor on a fast break so LeBron can drive and have a a, a wide open lane to the uh, to the basket? And hopefully we get a three point shot off of that because the three point shot, the percentage is so high, uh, and you know that it's a good shot, right? That's that's what he's saying. Here's more JJ. The last one I want to get into before we get into so just some ways to generate threes for catch and shoot guys. The other one, and I don't have the data in front of me right now, but I looked it up in January. Is we've seen it, James Harden and ISO, mm-hmm. Luca and ISO. Mm-hmm. Kyrie and ISO, mm-hmm. right? The yep. step back three, the mm-hmm. individual create Steph Curry, the individually yep. created s- step back three. Going back to the same tracking era, last 10 years, roughly 33% is the average value or, you know, average shooting percentage of a step back three mm-hmm. 10 years ago. Now it's a little over 35%. So it's gone up two percentage points yep. and the volume has gone up. Mm-hmm. Guys are able and willing, Jason Tatum, they're able and willing to take that shot, not only more frequently, but at a higher clip. I'm trying to explain here why offenses are good. Offenses are good and very hard. This shot is worth 1.5 more than this shot. That's so dumb. If you can make it. If you can make it. If you can make it. So what happens when? No, the value of this what happens, versus the value exactly. of this versus the value of this. So, right. So what happens when? Why do you think you got? I e. Houston Rockets yeah. missed twenty five or twenty eight straight threes. Have you seen it happen since? <laughs> I have not. <laughs> I have not. How many did they miss? Twenty seven. Twenty seven straight threes. Twenty seven. And they kept shooting them. Yeah. I, I, it's not like all of them was only three point shooters. It's not like they have fucking f- five Craig Hodges on their team or five Steve Kerr's on the floor where that's all they can do is shoot threes. They had guys that can, Eric Gordon, you can get into the paint. James Harden, you can get into the paint. But I, you're, you're making a valid point. But why? You're making a valid point. And I want to acknowledge your point. You still have to be a basketball player. You, you still have to read the game. That's all. You That's still all have I to ask. understand That's all I ask. time and score. So there's a time and place there's a, where analytics yeah. should be like, get the fuck out. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. There was, a, there was a coach that told me this year. He's like, you know, he talks all the time about like man, managing the game. And he's he's over there and he's looking at the at the box score during timeouts. And he's looking at how many threes have we made it. I would have fired that coach as soon as he did that. As soon as I as soon as I see a coach using analytics 
on how he's going to coach, he's fired. Like I, I'm, I'm a hundred percent serious, right? Like, and I'm glad LeBron said that sometimes analytics need to get the F out of here. Like, seriously, there's nothing that you can come and show me with numbers. That's going to tell me like his, he, he literally just broke down step back threes based on what we're seeing this year, based on what we seen 10 years ago. And people would use those numbers or those analytics and say, well, the step back three is being hit at this clip and that's a higher clip than something else. So we need to shoot more step back threes. They don't make no sense at all. Like there's certain parts of the basketball game that is necessary for other parts to work. Right. You just can't, you, you just can't come in here and tell, all right, put it, let's take it to another sport. If we're playing football and someone comes with, analytics and say hey on your on your mid me intermediate passes you're you're only averaging about six yards per catch and uh on your deep bombs you're averaging of course 20 plus yards per catch and you're catching those deep bombs at a 50 percent rate right but you're catching those short ones at a 55% rate. So technically, right, if I throw five bombs <laughs> and I connect on two or three of them, it's better than if I connect on uh, two or three uh, short passes, right? That's basically what they're saying, right? They're saying that, you know, hey, the mid-range shot, we're not taking that because the three-point shot, is worth because he said it's worth 1.5 more. If I shoot five threes and I shoot it at 30, uh, if I shoot it at 50%, I'm going to make two and a half of them. If I shoot five mid range, you know, and if I make, you know, all right, put it this way if I take six threes and I'm shooting at 50%, that's three uh, threes that I'm making, right? And that's three, six, nine, that's nine points. Now, if I take six mid range shots, and I shoot it at 50%, uh, that's only six points. That's that's how analytics work. Someone has sat down and as a, a as a nerd numbers guy has said, well, it doesn't make sense to take mid-range because I can just take threes, and even if I'm missing them at the same clip that I'm missing the mid-range, I'm still coming out with more points. But people don't realize how necessary the mid-range and the post is for the three-point shot, right? If you take it in boxing terms, right? If if I if you got a jab, if you got an overhand right, you got uppercut, and you got body blows, right? Let's just say let's just say face and body, right? So I got the face and I got the body, right? The body to me would be let let's let's say the jab to the face is the post game because that's something. Hey, I'm going in the post. You know, uh, because I that that can set other things up, right? I go in the post, they're setting things up, setting things up, right? Boom, boom, that's the jab, that's the jab, right? Uh, but every now and then, if 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 that jab is working so well, I might be able to jab and then come back with an overhand right. That overhand right can be the three point shot or something like that, right? Or 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 or, or it could be body blows to soften you up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, let's do it that way. Let's say the inside, the post game is the body blows. I'm going in on the inside to soften you up, get your defensive worn down. By the time we get to the later rounds, I, I you know, I, I done tagged this up so many times that now I can start hitting this these other things, right? Boom, I can start getting that face. I can start getting my jab off, my overhand rights and all that stuff. Cool, good to go. But that body blow was real instrumental to what I was able to do in those later rounds to your face, right? That's how I see basketball, right? But what they're saying with analytics is that uh, oh, you should you come show a box and say, hey, look, man, you only landed, when well, you, was, you was going to the body, you only landed 30% of those body blows, but you was landing like 70% of your jabs. So you wouldn't then go tell a boxer, just take jabs, bro. You land them more, just take jabs. Because the goal is not for you to land a high percentage. The goal is actually for you to knock the person out and win the fight. 
And that's the same thing with basketball. The goal is not for you to have a high percentage. The high percentage does not guarantee you a knockout or a win. The high percentage is the end to just a high percentage. But what the end result that we want is a win. So instead of him tracking his analytics and the end result is the percentage, you have to track it all the way to the win. The way you're talking about playing offense, how many rings did it result in? And for the purpose of LeBron James, who the analytics really love, you can count his five ring. Oh, I'm sorry, his three rings. Four if you count the bubble. You can count that. But look at what he had to do to get those rings. He had a super team to get two of them, and he had close to a super team to get the other one. Right? So, you have, I mean, I don't care what offense you run with the super team, you you go have a chance to 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 win, right? You know, it's a super team. So uh take LeBron James out of it. And who else is using the analytics and the three-point shot uh to to track how they go run their offense? Dan Tony, Dale Morey. So you got the Houston Rockets, James Harden, you got out, you got uh, Luca, you got all these dudes is doing it that way, and there's no rings that results from it. So if you take LeBron James out and his super teams, the people who are coaching this way are not leading to wins. So you have to track these analytics to the rings, not to the percentage. Because what they're saying, oh man, if 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 I could, if if a step back three, we hitting that 50%, we we're just gonna keep taking that. Hey, hey, uh, we sat down and we tracked your analytics. When you drive to the left, uh, you score 50% of the time, but when you drive right, you only score 25% of the time. So what that'll tell me is that, oh, well, what am I doing when I go to the right? Let me watch film on that and let me go fix that and get better with it. But now nah, the analytics, the way they coach, they're saying, no, nah, I don't only worry about the right. If you're hitting it from the left at 50%, just keep going left, right? Oh, man, if you're hitting the three, at a 50% clip when you do a step back, just keep doing step back three. That's that's not what that means, right? It's cool for you to be able to tell me that, you know, because now I can do something in my mind to make myself better. That's what that's what stats and analytics are for. They're not for, for you to come back and be like, well, let's start coaching uh based on these uh analytics. Let's let's you know, let's do more of that. No, basketball is still simple. The easiest bucket to get is the closest one to the basket. The easiest way to get close to the basket is in the post with a seven-footer. That's simple. A mid-range is going to be easier than a three. It's very simple. You got to soften up the middle to open that three-pointer up. The three-pointer is you, you have to threaten to go to the hole anyway. Either you're going in the post to a seven-footer like Shaq or a King, or you drive into the hole with a big guy like Giannis or LeBron. And every team don't have a Giannis or LeBron. So for everyone to be stuck on dribble drive. And furthermore, the last thing I say about this is the only reason why that even really works is because the NBA has helped facilitate it. When you use this five-man outspread offense, the only way it works is because it's predicated on dribble drive and kick out. Dribble and dish out. Dribble and dish out. Drive to the hole, dish out. That's the whole game. Drive and kick, drive and kick, drive and kick, right? But that drive would not even be... <laughs> that The drive won't even be uh, easy if they officiated the games where you can play actual defense. So people like Steph and these little guards, they wouldn't even be getting to the hole that easy because they would be getting housed and, uh, and, and, and harassed and beat up all over the perimeter. The freedom of movement won't be there. And that's what happened when Sacramento played the Warriors in the, uh, in the uh, playing game. They was able to harass Steph Curry, and that driving kick was not there, and him running off of screens off the ball was not there. The defense was too – stout and their entire offense was was done right they used to run a better offense uh before that but i think 
when Steph Curry went nuts on Boston in the finals, that was like, oh, we can we can do a we can do a little bit of James Harden ball with Steph Curry. Not when the defense has turned up. So the NBA had to help facilitate soft defense in order for that to even work. Because if you look at the playoffs now and you look at the three point percentages and the three point makes and all that stuff, eh, it ain't the same as the regular season. When the defense picks up, all of that stuff goes out of the window that JJ Reddit is talking about. And at some point, you got to have a guy like Ant Man driving to the basket or somebody in the post uh, like Jokic. Those are the teams that are successful in the playoffs. But uh, I'm off my soapbox, man. We right at an hour and a half, man. It was perfect. <laughs> that was a per- that was perfect timing, man. Y'all let me know what y'all think about all these topics in the comments. Um, uh, we'll catch y'all later on tonight with the full panel Friday. Um, leave your comments in the comment section. Hit the thumbs up. All of that good stuff, man. I appreciate y'all. I catch y'all on the next episode.